Studies and also the Associate Director of Comic Studies here at the University of Oregon. It is a fantastic job because it allows me to interact with people like our panelists today, all of whom are part of the Science Comics Initiative. So we will today be hearing first from my colleague, Professor Tian Tian Yu, who will tell you a little bit about the Science Comics Initiative. And then we will have some of our incredible student artists who worked with scientists on this initiative. So speaking today, we will have um, Paige Beersdorf will talk as well as Rose Gibeon, Isabel Lopez and Audra McNamee. And we will also be playing a video from Chloe Demomio. We are also joined by two of the scientists who partook in the project along with Professor Tian Tian Yu, who's the founder. So we have Professor Scott Fisher and Professor Praglov Karki, both of whom will also talk about their experiences. So I'm so excited to have you all joining us today. Professor Yu, please tell us a little bit about Science Comics. Great, yeah, thanks for the nice introduction, uh, Dr. Professor Kay. Um, so I am uh, Tintin Yu, I'm a professor in the physics department here at the, the University of Oregon. And um, this project came about um, with some discussions with uh, some colleagues here at the University of Oregon. When I discovered that um, University of Oregon, the comic studies program was the first dedicated comic studies program in the, the United States. I'm a big fan of comics. Um, I think they're a great medium to, to get information across. They're also just kind of visually very, very exciting. And so what I was, I've been interested in is this question of science communication and how do you convey scientific concepts to, to a broad, broad audience? And so through these discussions, I, um, I met Professor Kay and we uh, formulated this, this initiative. And so what happens in this initiative um, is that we uh, pair up a comic study student, so we'll hear from several of them in, in this panel, with a scientist at the, the University of Oregon. Um, so far, they've all been, uh, actually, minus one, they've all been physicists. Um, we had a, a neuroscientist collaborator as well. And through the course of uh, a quarter, so about 10 weeks, the, the pair creates a science comics based on the scientist's work. And so we'll be seeing quite a lot of um, those results that have been really mind, kind of mind blowing um, uh, pieces of, of art in, in this panel. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure what more. Um, we, we'll have a QA and a at, at the end. So if folks have questions about how the program really came about, how it's going, where we're going with it, um, we can discuss this at the, at the end. So um, yeah, perhaps we can move on to showing off some of the, the work. So the first um, comics uh, that we'll discuss are the comics that were made by Paige Beersdorf and uh, Professor Laura Jonti. I'll let Paige go ahead. Hey everybody, my name is Paige Beersdorf. I'm gonna share my screen here with you and share some images. Let's see. Okay, that's working for y'all. Great. I am so glad to be here with you. I'm so excited about this project and I just had an absolute blast working with Dr. Laura Jonti. Um, a little background about myself. I'm a freshman at U of O. I'm also um, getting my bachelor's degree later on in life. Um, so I have some experience in the past with uh, graphic design and with um, teaching. And um, I heard about the comics program through Dr. K at the library some years ago. And I just was so, so excited. Um, to learn that that was happening here in my hometown. And I'm uh, just grateful to be able to be a part of it now since I feel that comics have a great potential to uh, convey information, um, especially educational information in a way that is engaging to people of all ages. And um, that's exactly what we got to do here in this project. So um, I will do my best to speak on behalf of Dr. Janti. Um, and share what we did here together. Um, first thing, I'd like to share a bit about our process just uh, from the ground up, how we, how we built this uh, project up, and then I'll actually share the project 
with you. Um, starting off when we first met, we found we had a lot in common. We're both uh, mothers to young children and we're very passionate about science. And I was just stunned to learn more about what Dr. Janti um, was researching and absolutely blew my mind because I had never taken a physics class before and she was extremely patient with me, um, teaching me some uh, fundamentals uh, so I could understand the fundamentals to then understand the more complex work that she's doing. Um, so starting off, uh, we just started writing down a, a draft once we had an idea of um, the information we wanted to include. And that was pretty much entirely Dr. Janti's um, work. You know, I, I translated, you know, that's kind of the benefit of being the artist in this position and not knowing anything going into it is that I feel that um, I was able to translate some more dense information um, and help her out with that. Um, but really the essence, all the information and everything and the flow was, it was entirely hers. And once we had that, um, I began to organize that into pages and into panels. Um, we gathered a bunch of visual references. So this was the time to then um, take all of those words and those visual images and pull them together into something that felt um, more like a narrative, something that felt um, more complete. And we, we talked about our goals here along the way too. Um, we both knew that we wanted it to be informative, um, educational to illustrate her work. Um, but, you know, she also wanted some playfulness, a little bit of um, lightness and comedy. And I also wanted to include um, a sense of like kind of wonder and um, kind of meaning here because um, the work that she's studying here in physics is actually quite existential and, um, really beautiful and, um, you know, spiritual for some. And so we're trying to uh, convey that through our words, you know, through our images as we go along here. So um, here we've just compiled a huge Google Drive um, document just with all of our visual references, um, some sketches, some drafts that you can see here, and as well uh, as our, our text that we just kept refining and chipping away at all of these um, throughout the process as we met week by week. And then after we had our draft like a, that we felt pretty good about, I began um, a sort of final draft. Um, you can see these are the actual scans just scanned um, right in without any edits or anything like this large butterfly here. Uh, you can see that I used a blue pencil uh, to a first to lay down, a, you know, kind of grid system to get everything a little bit organized. And then I scan that in and it's really easy to go into Photoshop and just eliminate all of the blue. And so I love to use that for um, sketching, for under sketching. And um, for the black here, I used a grease pencil of all things. I've just been absolutely in love with this, all the, uh, you could call it a China marker grease pencil. It's a kind of crayon. And it's like really kind of difficult to work with, but it just has a beautiful texture. And um, I really, I just love how it looks. And so I did a lot of this um, black, it mostly in that. And then you can see on the lower left hand that sometimes I would just uh, draw elements all together on a page and scan it in and then kind of collage things together later on. So you can see um, upper left hand, sometimes I would just draw an entire page like as perfectly as I could and try to minimally edit it. And sometimes I would like piece together entire page um, to bring information together. And then you can see the meme here in an ice cream cone. Well, um, going along in this process of illustrating, I uh, just felt inspired to include some photographic collage to just really um, make the images pop a little bit more. And so I would uh, filter those black and white, sometimes even put them through like a charcoal filter and then um, kind of pop in some of these photographs into the collage and uh, then digitally color everything uh, later. This is our cover page, Symmetry in the Physics. There are a few different kinds of symmetry as you will find. So we touch on two different kinds in this uh, photo essay. Uh, 
Many kinds of symmetry are found in nature. For example, the translational symmetry of honeycombs or the bilateral symmetry of horned beetles or the Milky Way's rotational symmetry. Do symmetries exist at the scale of the universe or atoms or the fundamental particles which make up atoms and everything else? So here we are, we're, we want to start uh, with some, something that we can all relate to, whether or not you know anything about physics. We all are familiar with symmetry, just basic symmetry like we learned in geometry in class. And so um, Laura really helped open my mind up to different kinds of symmetry beyond just um, visual um, geometric kind of symmetry. But um, as you will see, there are other forms. Uh, through symmetry, we determine that every particle has an anti-matter mirror self called a charge parity symmetry. The particle anti-particle pairs behave almost identically, but not quite. So this symmetry is considered broken or asymmetric. And this is where it starts to get a little bit dense and here I illustrated matter and antimatter, um, kind of like mirror images to show how matter and antimatter um, are symmetrical in the sense that they're kind of opposites of each other, that anti that matter kind of fills in the place of antimatter. They're just beautifully kind of opposites. And what's the paradox here is that um, that physics defines some pairs as symmetric, even though they aren't absolutely perfectly symmetric and they're actually quite a bit off or broken. And once I understood this basic pr principle, after Jeanti helped me to understand this, I started to see just um, how interesting this is and what a beautiful revelation to find out that our world isn't, um, doesn't need to have perfect order in it in order to be absolutely perfect and that there is like this inherent kind of chaos element that is a part of the order and as you scale in and out um, into like universal scales you start to get a sense of how um, the chaos and the order are all a part of this one piece and kind of envelop each other like almost um, almost like for forever, like to be infinity. And it's like, it's just beautiful mystery. Um, I did my best to explain it there. So let's see, <laughs> if symmetry between matter and antimatter were not slightly broken or asymmetrical, then all of matter would have been annihilated by antimatter after the big bang. And this is kind of a separate revelation than the one I just described. Um, there are lots of revelations here with her work um, and what's what they're learning. But um, so far as like the just the miracle, the fact that we all exist, that we're all here, pretty amazing. And it's due to the fact that antimatter and matter do not completely cancel each other out. Like they aren't complete perfect mirror opposites of each other. When they greet, they don't cancel each other out. There's a little bit of an extra chaos element which is the reason that, you know, there's any matter here at all that is the reason that we exist, which um, we wanted to convey here and like both, you can see the earth, like this kind of existential universal sense, but then also kind of like just a wonderful universal miracle that we're here and that we can like look on our black mirrors and, you know, like find memes and enjoy candy bars and just live this beautiful life. Um, for example, if an up quark interacted with an anti up quark, then they would cancel each other out, creating energy in the form of photons. And yet mysteriously, they didn't all cancel out and some matter remained. And that remaining matter turned into all of our stars in the universe, our solar system and us. I was really called to this sculpture. So I made a full page illustration of it. Um, it's over at uh, Fermilab and I, I can't recall exactly where that is. It's, it's in the US here. Um, and what I love about the sculpture is that you get a sense of 
symmetry and that these pieces are all um, kind of identical, but then there's that asymmetry and that they're all slightly off um, from each other as they meet in the middle. And, and so it's kind of as close as we can get to a visual representation of what we're learning here in physics. So here's a new kind of symmetry, more information. Another kind is supersymmetry. And this theory offers solutions to how galaxies are formed or how the sun shines. With galaxies, uh, supersymmetry could explain dark matter, which is needed to predict galaxy evolution. Um, with the sun shining, it could explain what makes this step possible during uh, hydrogen fusion, which once again, I uh, would need Professor Jaunty to really describe all of this to you. So I'm not even going to attempt, but it's fascinating stuff and um, really eager to learn more about this. So this is, uh, she wanted, Dr. Jaunty wanted to leave readers with a, a sense of the mysteries that are still being explored and uh, what is currently being worked on, you know? It's just, there's so much that is still unknown. which is what we wrote right here. It says there are still outstanding questions about symmetry in physics and in nature, including whether or not supersymmetry actually exists. If it does exist, how asymmetric it is. These questions are being explored by accelerating particles at the Large Hadron Collider and studying the particles which are produced from the collisions using the ATLAS detector. And this is a uh, part part illustration, mostly um, image of the Atlas detector. It is vast and it's complicated. It's a beautiful um, machine and it's absolutely worth Googling and finding out more about how this all works and um, the technology is just really astounding. There were some images that I resonated with and didn't find a place to put earlier in the project. And so we decided to have a silent page with just uh, little tidbits that we both appreciated, like the first detection of antimatter. Um, once, once again, that's an illustration, but the image itself is beautiful to see. Um, and this uh, statue of Shiva I also felt like was a very interesting um, symbol that's embraced by the physics community for um, the, the cosmic dance, you know, the, this kind of spirituality in physics. What other symmetries exist? That's all I have. Thank you so much all for being here. That was excellent, Paige. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I really look forward to getting to discuss it more. Let's move on to Rose, if you want to tell us a little bit about your project. Yeah. Hi. Um, oh, dear. I'm sorry. My wife, I cut out for a moment. Um, perfect timing. Um, hi, my name is Rose Gibbian. I am a senior at U of O, majoring in art and technology and minoring in comic studies. Um, and uh, I collaborated with Tim Cohen to create, sorry. Could this be my computer does not want to cooperate with us today. Um, so, uh, the comic that we collaborated on um, was centered around his research into, um, so in a very general sense, um, particles that allow our universe to exist in the state that it exists in. Um, and because the things he's researching are kind of um, more heavily conceptual, um, we wanted to engage with them on a more like metaphorical level. Um, so the, the way that we're talking about them are is through this um, imaginary machine that creates universes and these little vague cosmic beings who are trying to create a universe. Um, and through that communicating some stuff about um, 
both some of these particles that he was talking about, but also the um, kind of experience of trial and error of trying to figure out how different particles work. Um, so we start out with a um, little instructions manual. We were initially trying to avoid words as much as possible because in the beginning when we'd been um, starting to try to write a script, all of the dialogue got very, very long and was like taking up all of our panels. Um, so we were trying to communicate as much of this as we could visually. There's still some things that um, work better if we could have some words, um, but we were able to make it mostly um, or without dialogue. Um, so we have trying to like set up the machine, create a universe, and then Oh dear, didn't work. Um, the, the universe isn't like quite stable or functional. Um, trying that again. Um, so this is where we come into the first concept that we were talking about, which is the mass of the Higgs boson. Um, sorry. Um, apologies. Sorry, um, my Wi-Fi is still giving me a little bit of trouble. Oh, forgive any like weird pauses. Um, um, yeah, so in the um, real world, we don't necessarily have the luxury of being able to just test if a universe would work with the, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, arrangement of um, uh, particles that, um, uh, we're theorizing, um, but there is a similar kind of trial and error of is like this particular um, arrangement of theories and particles going to work. Um, yeah, so we have the first attempted solution, which is adjusting the mass of Higgs boson, which is one of the things that um, Tim had been working with. Um, And one of the big things was trying to get um, increasing amounts of precision on that mass, um, which sort of uh, in terms of the um, real world science, um, kind of like zeroing in on specific mass. Yeah. Um, it still doesn't work. And then the next thing that we were talking about was introduction of um, the concept of super partners which are, um, I believe, um, for each uh, subatomic particle, it has a sort of corresponding partner particle. Um, yeah, so in the this, we decided to represent it as like a literal thing that needs to go into the machine. Um, and um, so addressing how much of this research happens, uh, same thing with the, Goodness me. Um, uh, Lord Hadron Collider. In this case, this is again where we went a little bit abstract, um, where um, in order to, I mean, real world, in order to like discover these, we need to use the Large Hadron Collider to collect research. In this little imaginary world, um, they need to. Um, uh, use it as a like source of transportation to like get to the place where they can um, find this information. Um, and one of the um, sort of obstacles that we um, came up against during this process is how to end the story because um, the research doesn't really have an end similar to what Paige was talking about. Um, and so we kind of wanted to address that we don't have all the answers yet and um, one of the both wonderful and sometimes a little bit frustrating um, aspects of research is like we think like we think we've like almost figured something out, but like nope, what we figured out is we're missing something. We need to research it more. Um, yeah, so we sort of wanted to address this um, with our characters have kind of taken the next step they need. Um, they haven't necessarily like perfected the um, ability to create a universe but they have um, like more information than they started with, which is sort of how um, our own research works. Uh, 
That's excellent, Rose. Thank you so much for walking us through all those pages. I really look forward to talking about these. Let's go on with Isabel, if you'd like to tell us about what you worked on in your project. Yes, of course. Hello, my name is Isabel Lopez. I am a freshman here at U of O, um, majoring in chemistry. And I was lucky to be partnered up with the wonderful Dr. Scott Fisher on the study of, on his research and his team's research of asteroids and being able to produce light curves and using global interactions and connections to further advance the research to be able to produce 3D models of what these asteroids most likely look like. Um, when we were first discussing kind of what we were looking for, I proposed that I wanted to uh, tell a little bit more of a story um, because the whole purpose of this project to combine arts with science is to be able to bring our research into a new medium in a way that more people can be exposed to what is going on with our studies. And I wanted to be able to tell a story that not only in, can encourage young people to pursue science if that is what they choose, but to also just have an appreciation for what is happening. So uh, when we were talking and building all of this, uh, Dr. Fisher was very kind and gave tons of information about how their uh, Pine Mountain Observatory, UVO's own personal observatory, uh, how they operate and how they have separate domes with different sized telescopes for being able to see further into space. And then also talking about exactly what is so special about these asteroids and being able to understand that they are putting pieces of a puzzle together in such a wonderfully special way, taking bits of information, the brightness of an asteroid as it orbits around the sun changes depending on how much surface area is available to reflect that sunlight. And so being able to take that information and produce a light curve to be able to kind of track those asteroids. And then also in partnership with a university in Japan called University of Kobe, which has special software to be able to build these 3D models really kind of is a story of exploration, of collaboration, and just of curiosity. And so I can pull up a and share my screen. Of the kind of comic. Uh, so this has a little bit more uh, kind of words and again, a little bit more of a story to tell for this. But in addition to the intellectual opportunities and social experiences, college is a time for young adults to explore their futures and how they're going to leave their mark on the world. Everyone has different passions and skill sets. So college offers the resources and guidance students need to find their path. Some walk into their classrooms knowing their trajectory and some hope to find their spark along the way. Um, every time that uh, there is a little bit of space involved, these are actual photos that were taken by our telescopes at Pine Mountain or uh, with our partners and stuff. So that way it could really just be more real. And I chose to go with a more subdued color tone and to have it be a little bit monochromatic to really make those pictures of space really stand out because they are gorgeous and beautiful. And it also kind of helps add to being able to make it a little bit relatable for everyone. Maybe it is astronomy and the study of the universe which calls out to them. At U of O, the physics department encourages students to pursue scientific advancement through undergraduate level research projects. Every scientist starts off as a beginner and every astronomer starts with a basic observing instrument, their eyes. 
They also begin their astro careers as the rare solo astronomer as they build connections, which will benefit them throughout their college careers. Especially in the realm of astronomy study, the classroom is not a place of division. In fact, the astronomy community is open to a wide spectrum of people and it invites all to participate and utilize their skills. Whether a STEM major or a liberal arts major, whether an undergraduate or a graduate in astronomy and in science in general, students will find a community in which they can grow, learn and live with each other. After expanding their understanding of the basics and after finding their community, students in an astronomy program are encouraged to develop their skills as a scientist through research projects. Those who are interested in an observational astronomy are often invited to visit and use Pine Mountain Observatory or PMO. Our own observatory located roughly 170 miles from the UO campus in Central Oregon. PMO is equipped with advanced telescopes and technology under one of the darkest skies in the nation, the perfect place for research on orbiting asteroids to take place. And a little bit of a pause. This was a really cool moment in discussing with uh, Dr. Fisher about one, the fact that U of O has our own observatory, which was something that I did not know before um, talking with him, but then also that this is one of the few places in the nation which qualifies as being a dark sky and a place with such little light pollution that the sky literally lights up under the light of the stars. And so being able to have an observatory that with that precious, clarity is just such a wonderful thing. And that was something that uh, Dr. Fisher really said that he kind of wanted to include. It's a little bit of a pride for us here at U of O and I completely agree. Asteroids are large objects, mainly made of rock that orbit between Mars and Jupiter. Many thousands of these objects are visible with Pine Mountain's telescopes, but only as so-called point sources. That is, they are so far away that we cannot see any detail on them, even though the largest ones are a few hundred miles across. The asteroids our students generally observe are generally 10 to 30 miles in diameter. Our scientific team, which is made up of students and faculty working together and observe together to understand these asteroids better. Specific asteroids are chosen to be tracked and the telescopes and cameras at PMO records the position and the brightness of the asteroid as it travels through space. Our students may take three or 400 images of an asteroid in a single night of observing. Afterwards, this data is analyzed and these images are used to produce a light curve, which shows how the brightness of the asteroid changes as it tumbles along its orbit around the sun. By computing the light curve of an asteroid, students can derive the shape. When we were talking about the resources and technology at uh, Pine Mountain Observatory, and also in talking just about what it really means to kind of observe, as an astronomer, um, I was very much enlightened by the fact that it takes a lot of patience to be able to sit through an entire night and to take pictures as you just see this tiny little speck continuously going along in the slight variations in the light to our perceptible eyes um, is just such a wonderful component of what this research is. And I love that it adds to making sure that people know that it isn't just a rock. Like there's a lot about this that makes it so applicable to a lot of different things. The work of our students doesn't stop at Pine Mountain though, as modern science transcends the barriers of distance, language, and culture. 
The collaborative efforts of scientists all over the world helped research projects like this one become even bigger and better. In understanding the knowledge or technology we may lack, cooperation becomes a necessary tool in unlocking the secrets of the universe. The light curves produced by U of O students are sent to partners at the University of Kobe in Japan. There, students and faculty have developed software and technology which uses the light curves measured at PMO to create models of the asteroids themselves. Using these programs, students at the University of Kobe are able to produce 3D CGI models of the asteroids. And this was something that I was thrilled to learn about because um, science really is one of those things that can go beyond language barriers or culture barriers. It is something that applies to all of us. And I think there is a little bit of awe in all of us for the universe and space. And so finding out that we have a direct partnership, an international partnership to help further advance this research because it is research that belongs to everyone. And it isn't something that's exclusive. It's something that we all can learn and benefit from and take off in. And I really appreciated that. From observing the targets as unresolved points of light to becoming a 3D model, the journey through a collaborative research project is almost complete. There is still much our students want to accomplish. The 3D models of the asteroids are incredible, but scientists are working on methods to use light curves to help distinguish what asteroids that are a single solid object and the rare rub rubble pile that is made up of many millions of small rock held together by mutual gravity. And I was, in, I was excited to learn about this component because I had never thought about that before, but it makes sense that there would be asteroids that are just a single mass or asteroids that are just a collective unit, but then also learning that this is something that we haven't reached yet. So there is, as uh, mentioned earlier, science and research, it's always a progression and we don't usually often have a stopping point. There's always another thing to look forward to. And it's so cool to see that these steps are already being taken and already finding methods that could be applied to figure out this phenomenon. Once the 3D models are complete, our students continue to collaborate by writing up their results to be presented at a conference like the UO Undergraduate Research Symposium. One of the main goals for this sort of project is to share the results with the scientific community and our students get to do just that. Beyond the asteroid project, there is always more to learn about the universe around us. This is merely a launching point, a courageous start for our peers to begin their journey. Through community, determination, and collaboration, they are going to unite and change the world. Well, that was the best pitch I've heard for astrophysics. Um, so <laughs> I hope, Isabel, that they hire you as the spokesperson for the department. <laughs> that was excellent. Audra, do you want to show us now your work? Absolutely. Um, so, hi, I'm Audra McNamee. Um, I'm a third year student here, uh, majoring in math and computer science, minoring in comics and cartoon studies. And I'm going to share my screen. I worked with um, Dr. Luca Mazzucato, um, who is part of the Institute of Neuroscience, and I believe is also affiliated with the biology and mathematics departments, um, to work um, to explain um, some of his work about serotonin, um, specifically um, how it impacts the brain. So I'm just gonna be walking through my comic here. Um, this is the cover page, A Trip into Serotonin, um, and here is our sort of main character slash POV character, um, and also an image of um, the chemical structure of serotonin. Um, so 
this is the first page. Um, what um, Professor Mazzucato and I were aiming for here was to have, um, similar to Isabel's work, a kind of fictional um, framing device um, within which we would be explaining some of this scientific information. Um, and the specific way that we tried to go about it um, in this case is to have sort of this point of view character whose internal um, monologue you were hearing alongside um, this just like fairly straightforward lecture um, about how serotonin impacts the brain. So this is opening, setting the, setting the scene. I'm not gonna be able to read all of this because there's a lot of words in it. Um, but some of the key points are, um, we tried to go for this like very green kind of color scheme um, as well as this sort of subtle um, like film grain appearance. Um, just to um, create this particular perspective. So um, in this page, we tried to transition the reader from being a like third person viewer to being within um, this like agent, this main character. So like on this first panel, um, we're directly behind this person. Um, but starting at the second panel, like we're within their field of vision. Um, and we tried to achieve that sort of with the like eyes closing, like tired effect, um, as well as like the speech bubble being slightly cut off. Um, and then after that, we were trying to like switch between as though the student was like looking up and down um, between the lecture and their personal like interior crisis of being hungry um, and searching for something in their bag to help fix that. Um, kind of a um, hopefully not a relatable narrative, maybe more relatable like a year ago. Um, so this third page, um, the presenter is starting to get into the swing of things. So they're talking about um, serotonin reuptake um, and just its various impacts um, in the brain. Um, what our main character is doing is they're continuing to look for some kind of like granola bar or something. Um, and then here at the bottom, we have like a set reference to the Utah teapot, um, which is just an object with a lot of importance in computer graphics. Um, it's something, it's just a teapot is an interesting object because it can cast shadows upon itself. So in the early stages of computer graphics, um, it was something that was used pretty often for research. Um, and this was a very slight hint um, that perhaps this could be some kind of simulation. Things may not be exactly as they seem. Um, so now um, the presenter is beginning to talk about um, serotonin and how the brain, um, how even a sober brain can perceive things in a way that are perhaps not exactly truthful. Um, so these bottom two panels here, um, the presenter is talking about how um, if you were primed, um, perhaps by seeing a lot of pastries, to be thinking about like baked goods and food, and then saw a kind of ambiguous picture like this um, in the second to last panel, um, perhaps initially because of this visual priming, you would perceive it as another baked good, like a blueberry muffin of some kind, before your um, the input, um, the external input really was processed by your brain and you saw that it was actually a dog. So talking about this kind of prediction slash input balance and also the student successfully gets their um, bar. Um, at the bottom here, you've probably noticed there are some QR codes. Um, I think, yeah, this page is where they start to maybe get slightly out of hand. Um, we were attempting to use them as footnotes um, as a way to insert more information than the information that we were already giving. Um, and I think that this is something that is interesting in a science comic, just because by its nature, you have to fit a lot of information in a small form. Um, and so this was a way to try to, within like this kind of overview we were giving, um, presenting the reader with like ways to learn more about the specific topics that we were touching upon. Um, I think this is where um, the comic gets really interesting, um, kind of on a technical level. So the um, presenter um, is beginning to talk about how um, when your brain is on psychedelics, so when these serotonin, um, these 5-HT2A receptors are stimulated, um, the 
balance between the input and the prediction um, that your brain is managing um, is kind of moved out of whack and various different symptoms can appear. Um, so the first thing is the altered perception of time, which I tried to convey through the like sudden change in pacing of the panels up top um, and kind of like the change in relationship between the panels. Um, I also um, kind of let the background color and the line art sort of like diverge from each other. Um, sort of like separating. Um, and maybe you've noticed on some of the previous panels, um, the like tail of the speech bubbles can like kind of, they move around a little bit, but in this case, they like are beginning to move around even more, kind of taking on a life of its own. Um, I also um, put the colors of this page through, um, I believe it's Google's um, sort of like AI um, like image processor, um, Deep Dream, to get kind of a computer's concept of like, just like, I, I don't know, like almost a computer's like static, like an AI static on top of um, the images that I had already produced. And then finally, the two threads of the comic, the um, like lecture, um, structure and the student's internal monologue um, begin to come together here, um, both like in the panel um, visually and also in the um, text before this next page um, where sort of like everything has come apart. Um, and so the, the goal of this was to um, be describing this point of view character as a simulation um, whose serotonin um, receptors had been tweaked um, over the course of the talk. Um, and this is the point at which they had been like ratcheted up so high, um, if we're using the metaphor of like a lever that you can turn, um, that the experience um, of this lecture became so intense that it's no longer perceivable by us. So now instead of perceiving through the eyes of this, simulated person. We are perceiving both kind of their vision through the glasses, but also a layer of themselves. Um, and then um, the lecturer is now talking about um, simulating using a neuromorphic chip, um, which is a real technology different from your typical simulation in that instead of just like running lines of code, it, it um, is hardware. Um, so the neurons are like hardware and um, it's kind of a more direct simulation of how the brain works. So I tried to switch um, the color palette and I also switched the texture that I was using on these pages. So there's still the kind of like grainy texture within the simulated world, but now there's kind of a papery texture and it's more blue in this like quote unquote real world. Um, and then this is the scientist probably before the presentation um, working at some kind of large data bank. Um, I tried to imply that this kind of like shelving unit was the like actual neuromorphic um, chip collection, the brain that all of this was occurring on. Um, and so now we're back to the presentation, but no longer within the eyes of the student. Um, and the presenter is now kind of talking about this work that they just did um, and talking about dialing up um, the 5-HT2A um, amount within a simulation. Um, and so this final page, it has first sort of a callback to the first page um, of the comic. And then the um, presenter um, brings up the concept of um, what it would look like if a simulation whose 5-HT2A receptor had been modulated throughout the course of the lecture, how it would have experienced the lecture. And so they set up that idea and then they press play. And then what we get is the um, initial panel of the comic where the student is coming in, um, ideally like in a kind of cyclical narrative. So if you then flipped back to the first page, you could just like smoothly transition through it and just keep reading it forever as a beautiful little concentric loop, um, <laughs> which I don't know how successful it was, but I think it's a fun idea. Um, and yeah, 
hopefully it works. I think that is about all I had to say about it. That's excellent, Audra. Thank you so much for sharing that as well. Um, I will now play this, which hopefully will go smoothly. So this is a presentation by Chloe de Momio. They are a marine biology major and are currently at the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. So they're in residence there. Let me know if you have any trouble with the sound. Hi. My name is Chloe DeMomio, pronouns they, them, and I'm a junior marine biology major currently studying at the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. This video depicts the last two of the four major steps in the production of this comic, inking and painting in that order. But before I could do any of that, I had to sketch the whole thing out in pencil, and before that, Jason and I had to design every panel of the comic from beginning to end. Jason Palos is an assistant professor in the UO Physics Department but this comic is about his interdisciplinary work and research in the modeling of long-range dispersal, a biological phenomenon. We spent a long time simply developing the comic itself. There were unique challenges inherent in what we wanted to convey. We knew that at some point we would need to show graphs, so we had to determine how those could be simplified and incorporated into the comic fluidly, and how we would create a narrative from this idea in the first place. Because we knew early on that we did want to tell a story about this research and its foundations. Writing a comic was something Jason had never done before, and while I had, including comic art about science, there was a moment when I realized that this was not going to be like anything I had made previously, because it was going to be so much better. I think it was when Jason came up with the idea to convey the ubiquity of dispersal mechanisms using a parallel narrative that I knew that what we were creating was greater than anything I could have made on my own. It's rare to be inspired not just to create, but to create to the best of your ability. This fellowship is a unique opportunity to collaborate. I had to ask Jason what about his research he most wanted to emphasize and share, and he had to come up with an answer to that question and others like it. Making something like this yields some very practical experience in science communication, because we had to make so many decisions about how to convey the information we wanted to convey. I think I've benefited a lot from the perspective this gives me, as a science major and as an artist. And also from the opportunity to not only do art in college, but to see proof in my own work and that of my peers in this fellowship that art and science can be combined at a professional level, something I had never expected to personally get to do. I will leave the Comic Science Fellowship determined to create more moments in my life and career where science and art, especially as a communication tool, combine. And when Jason and I publish this comic, I know we will both be proud of what we've accomplished. Speaking of which, when I said there were only four major steps in the production of this comic, I think I left out the true final step. Jason is digitally adding the text to the scans of the completed pages, a choice we made so that he could continually change the script as the art developed, a kind of back and forth otherwise not possible in a comic made traditionally. Making the comic traditionally led to a number of similar practical considerations, but also made it possible for me to make the time-lapse videos you're watching now. Let the Genes Fall Where They May was drawn on hot-pressed watercolor paper because it both scans and erases more cleanly than rougher, cold-pressed watercolor papers. I used two types of pen and two types of ink. The line art was done with a fountain pen and a waterproof black fountain pen ink that I selected after testing 10 different inks for their resistance to both water and erasure. The other pen is a dip pen with broad poster nibs and India ink. Inking with a dip pen was by far the most terrifying part of the process because it has the highest margin of error. If you mess up with a dip pen, you can spill a lot of ink on your page. Watercoloring put me back in my artistic comfort zone, but actually required more mental effort and just as much careful attention because the colors in this comic are very important. Color symbolism is used throughout the parallel narrative in order to identify the shared roles of organisms and not quite organisms in both narratives and identify the parts of graphs. In other words, there's additional information we want to convey using the color of the comic itself, so I need to be sure everything is the right color, and that I plan those colors well in advance so no errors occur. I've written many notes on the colors in this comic. I think this is a poor summary of what my experience with this fellowship was like, simply because it's difficult to share the scope of something that has fundamentally changed your understanding of your own work. 
but I hope it at least provides some insight into what's gone into creating our comic. Let the genes fall where they may. And I'd like to thank my friend, Sean Waters, for editing this video. Okay, so... First, I would like to invite all attendees and everyone in the audience to feel free to post questions into the Q&A. But because we have three of our scientists here, and I know Professor Fisher will be jumping off for another wonderful undergraduate research symposium panel, I'd like to invite Professors Yu, Karki, and Fisher to talk about your experiences being a part of this partnership. Uh, perhaps because of time, um, I have Dr. Fisher. Oh. His, and also because Isabel, his, his uh, artistic partner is here as well. Yeah, well, with the, thank, thank, thank you, Tian Tian and, and, and Kate for the opportunity. It was great seeing everybody's pro project. Uh, you know, we, 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 we all knew, of course, that all the different projects were going on, but this is the first time that we got to see them all together. And just one, so thank you so much. It went wonderful. I'm so glad to take part. Um, this was a, this was a, a neat project. Um, I don't think often, you know, as scientists, we don't think, oh, I think we, many of us think of science communication quite often, but not in this medium. And so that to me was, I think the, the, one of the coolest aspects of it was to be exposed to the creative process and how can we apply the creative process in the, in the science world. And, um, and Isabel and I, we had weekly meetings um, I zoomed up just like the rest of us, I bet. Um, and then, um, of course, exchanged tons of emails back and forth. And we had a Google Doc that we had a draft that we could both um, uh, work on. So, again, the collaborative nature um, was pretty cool. And Isabel and I commented, it was neat that she did not realize so much how collaborative the science world was. And, and, and so the, that was a cool aspect of it. We, we pretty early on, I think um, we, we had a real comfortable and informal, you know, kind of back and forth. And I, I, and so pretty quickly we were comfortable with each other, which led to being open. And so we had a lot of open discussions about um, what did I want to put in the comic? What did Isabel know? And what did she not know about, you know, the science? And, and we both felt that we wanted to tell a story about, we wanted to humanize the science in some way. And, and so to us, the um, the development of the protagonist through the through the story was quite important. Um, I, I I loved everybody's art style. One of the most difficult decisions I had was at the very beginning picking who to work with. It was tough, um, and but I'm I'm pr I'm proud to say that the style that I saw in Isabel's previous works shined through in what she produced here too. So I'm glad to see that. Um, I, I I love this idea. I want to do more of it. Um, I'm a, a big proponent of, of communicating the science that we're doing. And, um, and, and I just think this is a, a, a great um, synergy between the groups. Um, and it's a neat way um, to me, I mean, to see the work illustrated, literally illustrated um, in, in that way, it was quite a positive thing. Um, of course, there's always more we want to do. And, and we fought against the, is it going to be a 50 page you know, graphic novel, or is it just going to be a few pages? And and so, really paring it down was tough. And um, but I, I really do feel that the wonder of the project came across. Um, what we were doing compared to some of the concepts that you other folks were dealing with is pretty straightforward. You know, we, we take the pictures, we analyze the data, we make the light curves, and off we go. But conceptually, it's pretty neat. And one of the sayings that we kept coming back to was. Uh, it's a 20 mile rock that's 200 million miles away. And just by taking pictures of it, we can figure out the shape. And, and we wanted to convey kind of the wonder of the universal part, but also the specifics of the project. And, and I hope that that came across. Um, I can't think of too many difficulties, except maybe some vocabulary. Um, you know, Isabel was using artistic sort of and styling terms that I didn't know. And I was talking about it the ecliptic and, 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 and uh, potato shaped asteroids and things like that that she didn't know about. But once we got the, the sort of the mutual language down, um, I think that it went quite smoothly. And, and kudos to, to everybody. Um, and and, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing, um, um, I want to imprint copy. 
I want to see all these in print. I love seeing them on screen, but I want to hold them and see them um, and see them physical sometimes too. So if I can put a plug in, I'd love to see all of them sometime. It, it absolutely happened to, to take questions about um, the science, the project, or the process. Yeah, great. Thanks, uh, thanks Scott for your enthusiast. We also want to see them in print. So Kate and I are discussing about ways to, to make that happen. So stay stay tuned. Um, maybe we can have Dr. Karki discuss as well. So he's currently working in a collaboration on, on this. So you're still in the kind of, I guess, the more beginning stages of, of the process. So I'm curious to hear what your experience has been um, with this collaboration. Right, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, first of all, I just wanna thank uh, Kinti and Kate for starting this fellowship as a, uh, as a whole, but also like putting this session together because I think this session is going to be like really helpful for uh, people in the, uh, in the future, uh, people, scientists and uh, artists, uh, student artists who are going to work in uh, this sort of work in the future. Because, uh, because this, uh, this sort of fellowship is really new. And when I started my work this, this term, I really didn't know like to, what to go off, off from, except the examples that were already uh, up online. But I didn't know how the process was. I knew how, how the comics were, but I didn't know how the process was going to be. And the reason I wanted to come in today was to basically to learn like how uh, the process was was for all, all of uh, all of you. And uh, for me, like we're coming towards the end, uh, towards the like last stretch of uh, working on the comic. Uh, and uh, it has been uh, a tremendous experience working with uh, Jessica. I'm working with Jessica Bolden and she's fantastic to work with. She's creative, she's independent. And uh, uh, and so it, it, so like like Scott said, we at the beginning, we had this sort of informal discussions as to how, how we were going to proceed and sort of coming up with a script together and all this thing. And uh, once we came up with the script, uh, I came up with the science parts, like what we wanted to cover. And uh, yeah, I, I have some questions for you as well at the end, maybe if I get time, because like uh, I've learned a lot of things today uh, and uh, maybe I won't be able to uh, enact uh, some of the things because we, we're already in progress and coming towards an end. I probably won't be able to uh, enact some of the things I've learned, but I, there's, there's definitely some things that I learned today that I can apply uh, uh, while working to finish this comic uh, with Jessica. And yeah, again, uh, thank you all for all your uh, presentations today. And thank you for thank you to TNTN and Kate for putting this together. Yeah, thank you, Pragov. Um, so I wanted to make a, a few comments as well. So several people have brought this up. Um, but yeah, I I was one of the I was one of the first scientist partners, also <laughs> kind of by uh, <laughs> because I, I created this program, and it was yeah a very fascinating process to because in in scientific work when we give presentations, we a lot oftentimes we use slides, we have visual representation. So in some sense, we we already think. Um, of how to present our work in a visual way. But this is kind of an, another angle of looking at it. And personally, I found that um, I started thinking about my own work differently through, through this process. And you got a kind of a deeper understanding of yeah, like what exactly are, is the message I'm trying to get across? Is there a way besides just a graph to get that message across? And that was really fulfilling. Um, another goal of mine in creating the fellowship though was to, to show that there's more in common with arts and sciences than maybe um, people people realize. And that at the U of O, we're very fortunate to be at this great university with uh, this um, amazing kind of liberal arts program. And that there should be this discussion between like the humanities and the sciences. There's this great synergy between between us. We should walk across campus and talk to our, our colleagues. So I'm hoping this fellowship has kind of opened um, new connections for, for various people. Um, several of our students here are, are science majors, but clearly have great talents for for art and realizing that these are very compatible um kind of passions um that that work very well uh very well together um and i've had a great time also like working with uh, professor k it's been a blast and um and stuff like that so um yeah so i see that chloe has been able to to join us i don't know if uh, so we we played your your video which is fantastic um i don't know if you want to make any comments uh, um or... yeah um i mean i wrote the video fully thinking i wouldn't be able to show up so i don't think i have anything 
Um, and then I think our like schedule for today was slightly different because we had a like um, very low tide, so we were able to go. Well, y'all don't need to hear about that, but our schedule was slightly different because of weather stuff. Um, so I was able to come out here a little earlier because the lab was um, a little earlier today, so I could step out. Um, but if anyone has any questions about it, um, I can answer those or anything like that. Um, but I mean, I guess my one comment is it's um, it's in the like last step for our comic, which is I'm painting it still. And so that's where the comic is at. And because I made that video, um, there's part of each page that has been painted because I wanted something from each page for the video. So it's a, so it's at, it's at a very interesting point in the finishing process where some part of each thing is like, for some part of each page is basically completely drawn and colored, um, but um, very, very few part pages uh, are actually like fully completed in a way that you would normally work on a comic fully sequentially. So it's at an interesting part, but it's uh, going really well. Actually, one comment, I, another comment I wanted to make that I was thinking about was um, we saw that there was this huge kind of diverse range of artistic styles as well. And for example, um, Paige and Rose were both working on, on particle physics. And there were you know, several themes that showed up in both, uh, both comics. So for example, this concept of supersymmetry was, was in, in both of them, but to see how the different teams decided to present um, that concept, I think was really was really interesting. And you get different insight depending on how, how you present it. Um, and I was I just want to make a comment with, with all of you, you explained the science so well that I was really quite, um, quite impressed that in some sense that this, that was a demonstration that this fellowship it kind of accomplished the goal of taking, a, I think fairly abstract, um, fairly high level particle physics concepts and making it accessible to people who are not experts in, in that field. So this idea of symmetries, um, creating a kind of what we call the baryon asymmetry, which is why, why we exist, or supersymmetry, which is a, or like and tuning of the Higgs mass, like that's a, a very, that's something I learned in graduate school, like as a, a physicist, not something that I had heard of before. Um, but you were able to explain it in a way that, that I think made, made a lot of sense and really got the, the gist of the, the idea behind it. So that was, that was like very kind of gratifying to, to see that uh, in, in these explanations. Yeah, yeah, I have a general question. Did did all of the artists, did all of you use a blend of traditional and digital, you know, techniques? Is that, yeah, I mean, it sort of looked like it. I think that, that, and is that kind of de facto the way that modern comics and the way these projects, is that just the way it works these days? Does anybody go do all digital or all old school or is it all blended like that? And just a general um, question, yeah. I would call mine really close to all old school because um, yeah. the only part that is being done digitally is the um, narration text. So some, okay. of, some of the text even is, I mean, it was apparent in the video, some of the text is be, has been hand done. Like for our title page, uh, we, have, we decided to include some references for the research and I hand lettered those and it was, uh, took a long time. And so some of the text that we wanted to separate, any text that we wanted to separate from the narration I did by hand. So only the, narr the narrative text is um, digitally added. So the rest of it okay. is just hand done. Um, but I think there is a lot of doing line art traditionally and digitizing the line art and coloring it digitally that gets done. Gotcha. Um, I know I do that. I did that for the portraits that we had um, in the magazine. Hmm, slick. On the opposite side of things, while I have done um, like entirely traditional comics in the past for this project, I think every single drawing I did for it was digital. I, digital, I don't yeah. think I did any traditional. Yeah, I, I'm just fascinated by the blend. It, it's neat to see, you know, I, I, to me, it seems like there's great power in that because you can take the best techniques from both realms and pick and choose, you know, the ones you, you want and use them that way. I was really, yeah. that, that was really cool to see. Lately, I've been using it. Um, we do uh, drawings of animals in my invertebrate zoology lab. We sketch the organisms. And um, lately, I've been using it to um, color in some of my sketches and clean them up with the ones that I think came out really well. Um, like I, we had this hemichordate worm, um, Sacoglossus, I forgot the species name right now. Um, and um, the sketch came out really well. I felt like it was really accurate. So I digitized the line art and I colored it in and I, um, I can have a version of it um, that way with labels and without labels. And I have this like 
really clean version of that drawing. And I can do that from pencil drawing even yeah. um, in that way. And it's on copy paper originally, something I couldn't have colored in nicely um, if I did it traditionally. So it, it does definitely give you a lot of flexibility, especially stuff like this, where you're like working in the lab and you can't use nice paper in the lab because we have a seawater lab. Mm -hmm. Stuff that would get messy. Is sort of on a related topic, one of the most um, helpful things I learned about, because uh, sort of similar to Chloe, I did a um, mostly traditional with um, digital lettering. Um, but one of the things that Tim and I also um, realized is um, when you're doing completely traditional, you have to have every single, all, all the panels on a page on the same page of paper. And if something goes wrong with all those panels, too bad, you have to do, overdo, you have to do the page over, um, which can a little bit heartbreaking sometimes to have to start something over like that. Um, some of the really helpful things about um, working partially digitally was when something went wrong or didn't get executed quite um, the way we wanted to with one panel, um, we were able to swap it out with a panel drawn on a different, on a fresh piece of paper. Um, so it was really helpful to get a, um, even though most of the illustrations were done traditionally, all the formatting could be at the very least cleaned up and altered digitally. Um, which I think made for overall a much more cohesive piece. Yeah, I've mostly avoided that problem by, because um, I don't have, I think, the tools I would need computer-wise right now to um, do as much of that. Also, the, also the panel format me and Jason went with makes it so hard. Um, for our diptych, it would be very, very difficult to swap panels out unless because of the DNA barriers and the way it's all tied together, um, it would become a real issue. And I've mostly avoided that problem by being extremely careful. <laughs> but when I do the dip pen parts, it's really stressful because if I um, if my hand slips while I'm eating, doing something with a dip pen, it's just it's all over. <laughs> it's like um, it, that's just it. Um, so it's like very painstaking process <laughs> but the uh, hot press watercolor paper is forgiving with the watercolor itself if I put color in the wrong place sometimes I can just like wipe it right off if I'm really fast maybe a, a general question for for everybody was there anything unexpected or surprising about this collaboration that you hadn't anticipated or thought thought would happen um, either, either good, good or bad hopefully hopefully good or did everything kind of like go go as you had anticipated it would? I don't think I anticipated how much of a collaboration it would really be. I think um, I kind of understood it as you talk to someone about their research, then you make a comic for them, but that's not actually how it works at all. It's a definitely, it's definitely a true collaboration. And that wasn't something I'd done before and it was a lot more rewarding than I expected. Um, so that was like basically a kind of art I hadn't really done, uh, just, because of that. And I also didn't expect um, how good it would be, <laughs> like how committed I would feel to the, pro the project itself and how much I would want to make something that was like the best of the, like to, to the best of my ability. Um, so overall, just like the depth of the collaboration that it is, like, I didn't expect that. I didn't understand that going in and it was really rewarding. Yeah, I actually didn't have any expectations because I've never done anything like this before. But it, it has been like really nice uh, working with Jessica. And uh, uh, yeah, actually, she, she was telling me like she expected to get a lot of equations from like uh, since it was physics, but we are not focusing on a lot of equations. It's like mostly images and things. And she, she was surprised that uh, there wasn't as many equations as, as she thought there was going to be. So that was one one thing that I remember uh, she tell, uh, her telling me. I know that for me, it was uh, just a really cool experience to be able to do something a little bit on a bigger scale because uh, the portfolios that I had submitted and stuff were a lot more casual and kind of more comedic stuff. So trying to tap into, okay, what is the symbolism we can use? What are the different parts? Uh, and like, how can we make this really effective? Um, and I remember there was a couple of moments in talking with Dr. Fisher where he'd be like, oh, we could do this. And I was like, that's so much better than what I was thinking. Why aren't you creating this yourself? Uh, but it was just a really wonderful moment to be able to push myself um, past 
my point of comfort and to be able to explore more. And then also the collaboration part of it was just, I was expecting that, but it was just so much better than what I was anticipating. So, Yeah, Isabel, I would say, I think it went smoother than I would have predicted. You know, you know, the first couple of times we met, right, we had some vocabulary things where we talked about how the telescopes worked, but, but overall it was quite smooth, I thought, you know, and, and, um, that, that I thought was a great, that was again, something a little bit of a surprise. I thought, well, an art student, I, I've never, I've never, don't think I've ever spoken to an art, well, I mean, I art students in my astronomy 122 class. Okay. But, but uh, to collaborate directly, I was a little nervous at first. Y'all were imposing, believe it or not, you know, and, and I was like, what if she makes me try to sketch something, you know, and that, and that was as terrifying as you are of equations. That's to give me a blank piece of paper and say, draw something and the sweat starts pouring. So, so I appreciated the ease that once we got the gears, you know, in sync with just being able to talk about the vocab, we, 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 I thought we had a, you know, it just, we banged ideas off each other and, and um, converged fairly quickly on the idea that, look, we want a human side to show the journey of the, of the student along with trying to talk about the, 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 the science. And I thought, I thought that was great. Um, Jason actually ended up drawing some of the like later storyboards and he had, he did some quick little sketches to like explain what it was. And he was like, I, I, I almost don't want to show it to you that compared to the drawings you've shown me. And I was like, you're being, these are so good though. <laughs> so that really reminded me of that what you just said. <laughs> Um, so he did end up drawing for ours, so I guess we're all lucky. I'm um, wondering with um, either Paige or Rose, because you're both like very, I think because the, the, the other three of you have some science, are science majors at, at some level, um, but Paige and Rose, I believe both of you are, are not. Um, did this make science feel more accessible to, to you and less foreign, or are you still a bit like, it's not, not my thing. <laughs> um, I actually, I, science and art have kind of been my two great loves in um, school since um, I don't really know how long. And even though um, career and education wise, I've pursued art more just because that's where more of my skills lie. Um, I'm still, I've always been really passionate about science and I'm always looking out for opportunities where I can engage with that side of my interests more. Um, yeah, and I, I've also found there's a lot more overlap. I think um, other people were mentioning this a bit more earlier, um, but there's way more overlap than I'd always initially thought between um, science and the arts. And a lot of people that I know, um, either uh, fellow art majors are also interested in science. And um, a lot of folks that I know from um, who are sci majoring in science are also like artists of some sort. Um, yeah, so I feel like the two subjects intertwine very easily. Similar to Rose, I've been really interested in, in science for a long time too, and really interested in finding a way to merge my interests of science and art. Um, I have experience as an environmental educator, being a science teacher and um, taught some art classes with kids. And that kind of got me thinking about how those two can merge. And from this project, I absolutely gained a lot of confidence in my ability to translate in information. Like it was a daunting task. And I have to admit, I was incredibly overwhelmed by the amount of information and just like, just a new field I didn't know anything about. So um, I'd have to say that it absolutely strengthened my interest in merging those two and like even entering a career in um, creating like curriculum or educational materials or educational books or educational comics for youth um, really helped me uh, realize that that is a passion and like absolutely doable. However, even though I might not know all of the information, you know, I can learn. So I gained that confidence, really grateful for it. Yeah, that's so great, great to hear. It's kind of what I was hoping to hear is that it gave you confidence to do, to do, especially with, because um, I think like especially particle physics sometimes has this like barrier towards it where people are like, oh, this is very hard. I'm not going to understand, um, but that's 
that's not necessarily the, the case. So yeah, that's very, very good to hear. Um, I don't know, Professor Kay, if you had any additional questions, otherwise. Well, and we have often a few you're more. even going to use uh, comics right as the format for your honors thesis on computer science. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely my plan and absolutely a product of this initiative. Um, I'm making my like honors college slash um, computer science thesis. And I'm hoping to kind of cover um, the breadth of introductory computer science. Um, so like get in just like intro programming, but also all of the different like algorithms, AI, like applications and concepts that you end up learning in kind of your first year or two of computer science um, and get that into a comic because I, I feel like all of that is very visual and also it might not be what's intuitively understood as this is what computer science is if you don't have that background in computer science. So I'm really excited. Yeah, I mean, I think right now we're clearly developing a startup that does a lot with science comics and will make us all millionaires. So I'm glad we had this opportunity to talk about all of our work. Um, I would actually love going back to Professor Karki's statements earlier. I'd love to hear if everyone here could share a piece of advice that you would give to people starting the collaboration. So something that you know now that if you could go back and start it again, you might tell people in terms of how to do science comics in this collaborative way. I'll pass along some advice that I actually received um, maybe even from Audra, which is to create a, a schedule and um, stick to that. That was incredibly helpful. Have a week by week deadline and those weekly meetings were crucial. I definitely agree with that. I don't know if I gave you that advice, but that's 100% something I know I need to do. Um, maybe the other one is like another organizational aspect. Know what your key questions are. Like what, what are you trying to convey on a very broad level before you get in and start trying to like hash out page by page what you're doing? Um, lean into the collaborative aspect of it. Be ready to compromise on ideas and like really listen because when you do, that's when you'll have the best ideas. And it also it'll make it easier to um, like learn about the subject you're going to be writing about because um, it's probably going to be a little bit out of your real house, even if you are a science major. Like I'm like we uh, we were talking about something even tangentially biological more than that. Um, and I am doing a bio major and still this was something I hadn't really like heard about, read about about had to ask questions after I read the paper kind of deal like be ready for that and be be excited to ask questions because you don't always get to read someone's paper and then ask them questions about it and then help them represent it that's actually really cool like a way to interact with like a, a topic like on many levels it's going to help you learn something in a really cool way um this is sort of covered before but I'd really emphasize that remember this is a collaboration um, before this, I had mostly worked in the extremes of either individual projects or commissions, where either individual projects where I had all of the control or commissions where I was all just carrying out the ideas of someone else. Um, and so I think it's really, really important to remember to um, combine both like your own original ideas with and uh, sort of how um, Chloe mentioned like um, Gonna need to compromise but oh like if you can get that process to work you'll come out with something far stronger than either person could make individually i might suggest to uh I, again i just uh, i wanted to recognize very early that we had very complementary skills and 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 the, to meet in the middle and, and to me, it was important to establish, you know, kind of an open, an open relationship with, with Isabel, um, which, which allowed me to ask her what I felt like were kind of basic and how do you draw, <laughs> how do you draw an asteroid, you know, sort of thing. And, and, but, but I hope that it, you know, it gave her the ability to ask, you know, kind of basic questions about, well, what's it like to observe? And so building a, an open relationship early, I think let us, 
I, I don't I don't think we had a single awkward conversation throughout the whole time, even when we were asking very basic questions and just learning vocab and things like that. So um, that that I felt that, that I felt would, would be something that we would do again. I would do that again next time. Sort of to build off of that. Sorry, I don't mean to um, drop in twice, but um, when uh, from the artist perspective, when you're sort of getting a baseline, remember all of those like questions that you had about background information, because you're going to want to include some of that. Um, and that is something that I wish I had done more of. I wish that I had like made myself a, a spreadsheet or a note of something of like, okay, I need to explain this, 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 and this. Um, yeah. And um, just in general, um, keeping notes of your process are very, very helpful, mm -hmm. um, both for if you need to go back and change something or, um, yeah, just generally having a record is very helpful. We, we talked a little bit about the audience, too, very early. What, what is the audience for the finished work going to be? And then scale the scientific terminology and the concepts to what we thought was the appropriate audience. And I, I that's something that I would definitely do again early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really just the collaboration and also like the goal, like know what you're aiming for in terms of audience impact, in terms of just what information you need to tell and just the collaboration, like really be open to on both sides of how to produce the best possible work that we can. So we are unfortunately just out of time, but I am so proud to be a part of this program. I'm so, so proud of all the work that you did. And I definitely think as Paige said, you should feel so confident coming out of here. The work that you've shown today isn't just amazing science communication, it's outstanding comics. So thank you all so much for sharing your work with us and for taking the time out of your day to talk about it. This is really, really wonderful. And again, I'm so proud of you all. Thank you. And I think that they will cut us off momentarily. But <laughs> I do, I stopped our recording and I just wanna thank everyone here for being a part of this initiative. And thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for setting yeah, this up. You. Yeah, absolutely.